On, off, simple, the flick of a switch. Yet this simple switch, on, off, is the life force of all digital systems, the pulse of every modern communication and computation device on the planet. In the first half of the 20th century, vacuum tubes, which amplify sound, were a key component in phone systems, radios, and televisions. They could also rapidly switch electrical signals, on, off. Early computers depended on them, from a few hundred to over 50,000 in each machine. But vacuum tubes were prone to failure and generated too much heat. The sheer number required for even simple computation created an obstacle to more powerful computers. December 23, 1947. Three scientists at Bell Labs demonstrated a radically different amplifier. They started with germanium, a semiconductor that both conducts and insulates electrical currents. By placing gold wires on germanium to manipulate the current, the first crude transistor was born, but it was fragile and not commercially viable. One of the scientists, William Shockley, continued working on his own and developed a robust version. The transistor was ready to move outside the lab. Within 10 years, vacuum tubes were almost completely replaced by transistors. Dr. William Shockley is one of three Americans sharing the physics award for research which produced the transistor. Dr. John Bardeen shares the prize. The third colleague is Dr. Walter Hauser Bratton. William Shockley's brilliant work on transistor technology was trailblazing, but his difficult personality alienated others throughout his career. In 1955, Shockley moved to Mountain View, California and founded Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory. He rounded up a team of young, top-notch scientists and engineers. But Shockley's style quickly frustrated his new team. In 1957, eight key employees left to launch Fairchild Semiconductor, less than two miles from Shockley Labs. Summer 1958, engineer Jack Kilby knew at his job with Texas Instruments hadn't accrued summer vacation. Instead, he spent his summer wrestling with a problem. I began to work on what was then called circuit miniaturization. Complex digital systems at that time required thousands of separate parts, wired and soldered together on printed circuit boards. But they failed often. Kilby believed he could do better. I began to think, about how much you could do with semiconductors and realized that you could make all the circuit elements that you needed. On September 12th, with upper management watching, Kilby presented his solution. A slice of germanium, wires protruding, attached to an oscilloscope. He flipped a switch. An unending sine wave undulated across the screen. Kilby had taken the first step toward creating the integrated circuit and with this device, cracked open the portal for modern computing. A stream of innovation followed. While working to improve Fairchild Semiconductor's new transistor design, Jean Erny developed the planar process, covering a silicon wafer with oxide and forming the transistor underneath the protective layer. This improved reliability and made automated manufacturing possible. Director of R&D Robert Noyce made the next leap. He proposed depositing aluminum wires on top of Ernie's planar process to interconnect the transistors. This solved a critical limitation of Kilby's approach. A team led by Jay Last combined the work of Noyce and Ernie to produce the first practical, easy to manufacture family of integrated circuits. Processes, product, packages, price. Oh yes, and production. Invented here. Ernie's 
At RCA, Frederick Hyman and Stephen Hofstein combined Fairchild's planar process and other innovations to squeeze more transistors onto a chip at lower cost. Silicon ingots sliced into wafers. Wafers etched with transistors. Transistors interconnected into complete circuits. Circuits cut into separate chips. This was the technology that would change the world, and quickly. Driving the explosive growth was Moore's Law. In 1965, Gordon Moore observed that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit had doubled every year. I just took that doubling every year and extrapolated from 60 to 60,000 components for the next 10 years. By putting a lot more stuff in a chip, we were going to make much cheaper electronics. Today, more than 1 billion transistors can be etched on a circuit chip. All of the Fairchild 8 ultimately left Fairchild to launch their own startups. In 1968, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore co-founded the Integrated Electronics Corporation, Intel. Lift off on Apollo 11. Autumn 1969. Ted Hoff, a recent Stanford grad and new hire at Intel, was working on a desktop calculator for Japanese client, Busycom. Hoff and Stan Mazur proposed a single chip central processing unit that could be programmed to handle many different tasks, essentially a computer on a chip. Recognizing huge potential, Intel negotiated with Busycom to keep the rights. In 1971, the concept was implemented by Federico Fagin's team, which included Masatoshi Shima. This microprocessor was the forerunner of today's multi-billion dollar chip industry. The age of the microprocessor had begun. The first microprocessors burst onto the marketplace. These inexpensive digital computers created unprecedented possibilities for new inventions. Chip manufacturing gave Santa Clara County a new identity, Silicon Valley. The population grew 600% as engineers, computer scientists, and high-tech workers swarmed to the new technology mecca in Northern California. Computers, once available only to governments, large corporations, and universities, began appearing on the desks of small companies, in the garages of hobbyists, and into the awareness of the modern world. Smaller, faster, cheaper, and more powerful than ever before, today's microprocessors are an essential element of life, running iPods and airplanes, cameras and power plants, simple toys and space stations. As far as the silicon engine has brought us, and as far as it will take us in the future, it still relies on a simple switch, the pulse of technology. On, off. <laughs>